So, uh, hi, I'm Jan. I'm at the uh, Harry Ward University in Edinburgh. And for a while now, I've been sitting on this new framework uh, in Isabel. So just first to get everyone on the same spot, um, what is a binder? So um, if we have some syntax of a program language, for example, in this case, this is just a simply type lambda calculus. And in the papers, there's usually nothing else. Yeah, it will be bigger later on, James, I know. Um, there's usually some construct that has a variable that is somehow in scope in another part of the, the syntax. And in most papers, this is implicit by this being a lambda, um, but uh, we mean intuitively that this x is available on this right-hand side. And this also comes with a few more expectations. For example, um, the name of the variable or what exactly it is, it should not matter as long as the structure is the same. Um, and we need to be a bit careful if we want to substitute in those variables. So if we have this uh, term where we have this x that is by, uh, used here and want to apply this to this y, we need to be careful to not just literally paste it in because then we would change the meaning of the program. But we need to first rename this uh, inner variable to something new, for example, z, to not change the meaning of the program by substituting. That's all pretty standard. So um, just quickly, what is Isabel? So Isabel is a theorem prover based on simple type series, so it's no dependent types and nothing else. Um, they're contrary to, for example, languages like Haskell and I think also Agda, um, constructors are written after their parameters, so uh, ML style. Um, expressions in the logic itself are quoted. That's, yeah, everything outside is basically commands. Um, it has a lot of very powerful proof automation. Um, and the important part for, for my work in this case, none of these things that look like built-in syntax are actually built in. So uh, Isabel allows the user to define new syntax for the language, including, for example, the data type command where I will hook in. So yeah, I'm working on formalizing Haskell core basically, and I want to extend it later with Rose. So that's where I come from. Um, so to get on with the topic of the main talks of data types. Um, if we have, again, our example of the simply type lambda calculus, we would like to express this somehow um, that it has this binder in there. Um, you might also have some types, that's fine. So types, there's nothing, no scoping going on, no types. We can just use an ordinary data type uh, to represent those, nothing magic here. Um, the new thing is now where this binder comes in. So we, I, I'm working on this new binder data type command. Basically allows you to define a data type similar to the ones that Isabel already has, and it's very similar to other languages, but that allows you to specify these binding relations directly as part of the data type. So here I, I give this lambda binder a name, and I give this inner thing a name, and I can just say, okay, yeah, please bind this X in T. So from the usability standpoint, that's very nice. We can specify that, but what does specifying mean in this case? So first of all, this data type, the equality on this data type. So Isabel, the simple type theory has built an equality for all types. So there's no types that are not, have not a notion of equality. Um, but for this type, this notion of equality is alpha equivalence. That means we had exactly this property that we wanted earlier, that the names of the variables do not matter at all, no matter what I use as variables. Um, the other thing is you get a bunch of stuff for free. So you get a function that extracts all the free variables of a term um, into a set, and you get parallel substitution. So this is, it takes this function from variables to variables and substitutes them in an expression. You get also a term for variable substitution. There's a little asterisk there because you only get that for free if there's some sort of injection, a free variable injection in your type. If there is no directly visible free variable injection, uh, then you need to prove that there is one and then you get one for almost free. But in this case, we have a very clear injection of free variables into the type. So we get this substitution, uh, this term for variable substitution as well for free. And again, this is a parallel substitution. It can substitute um, almost arbitrary amount of variables. 
Um, the thing I did over the last uh, few months was basically implementing a binder fold, which gets you, with this, you can define arbitrary functions um, over such a data type. And you see here, it looks like a normal fold, so, but with this extra P thing in the middle. And this P thing is the important thing because that is what this uh, function will automatically avoid. So uh, in, in normal papers, you see often this way, we assume all bound variables are different from insert X. Um, and this is exactly where we can keep all those, what we want the bound variables to avoid. So with this, we can say, so in, in this case, the substitution functions are both special instances of this general fold where we use the, the variables that these functions actually substitute to avoid. So we don't never clash. We never come into the problem we saw on the first slide that we would substitute uh, in error. Um, okay, this is a bit slow, low, but the other thing that this type gives us is a better induction principle because a normal induction principle is not that useful if you want to prove anything with this because you usually need to assume, again, uh, the variable convention is that the bound variables do not clash with anything I actually currently care about. And that's exactly this extra assumption you get during the induction for all the cases that bind some variables. You say, I can assume that the bound variable is different from the stuff I care about. So that's all the stuff you get for free. But what can we actually express now with this? So one dimension we can extend this uh, example is, for example, to add a different kind of variable. So system F has now in the types some variables going on. And this is basically similar to the original data type in the first slide, in, in the last slide. But expressions now bind two different kinds of variables. So again, this is very implicit in, in this general presentation, but we have this uh, binder that binds type variables and this uh, small lambda that binds value variables. And we can just parameterize this type by two different kinds of variables and have one that binds the, uh, this of this value variable in its uh, recursive um, part and one that binds the type variable part. And you see the important part here is we also carry through the same type to this uh, other type data type. Um, so this way, the, the variable that is bound will also be available in, for example, this term here. So we can bind through other data types very easily. This is what makes uh, the whole framework very modular and makes it, you can, you can first prove a property on the type and then later use it in a bigger proof about the terms, uh, which is a good thing to have. And it's good what is currently available, especially in Isabel, not always the case. So, um, okay, yeah. Uh, we can extend this now further. If we go back from system F with multiple kinds of variables, what is the structure we can change? So not the binding structure, but just the structure of the type itself. So one thing that is very common is if someone binds multiple things at once. So here we extend this syntax, basically, we can bind an arbitrary number of variables at once in a lambda term. And in this case, we can replace the, our, it is uh, just a single variable with a list of pairs. And we still say, okay, all these variables should still be bound in there. And that still gives you, so any of these examples still give you all of that for free. So the substitution, you will still get for free from that. So even though we compose now, we bind through another data type. So list is a standard data type in the Isabel standard library. We bind through another data type. We still get all the substitution for free and all the theorems for free, including the induction theorem. And so another thing is, but this list could still have the same variable multiple times, which is usually not what you want to express if you mean binds multiple variables at the same time. Usually you mean they should all be distinct uh, um, in, in, in the right-hand side. So we can express this by basically introducing a type def. A type def is an isable feature, basically where you can uh, define a subset of a type and have that as a new type. So here we say, okay, uh, our distinct association list type is all the lists such that the first element of the list is distinct from all others. And then we can replace our original just the list with a, this different type. Again, we are now binding not through a data type because this is not a data type anymore. This is a, like a subtype. Um, but 
we can bind through this other type without issue um, because it is in some sense well behaved. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, this should, I should have had here a type annotation that says uh, KV, uh, uh, so basically here, this, this uh, KV pair list, sorry, yeah, there should be a type annotation on, on this access that is, this is a list of pairs such that the first element is distinct, yeah, good point, sorry. Um, then another thing, so this is already something that is uh, not possible with nominal two, which is what is currently available in Isabel. Uh, but you can still do this uh, in with, uh, for example, the Brown indices, because the Brown indices by their definition are always distinct. It gets a bit more hairy if we don't care about ordering of these uh, variables. So, in this framework, we can just say, okay, yeah, instead of binding a list of things, we can define, in this case, a finite set of these things. And the same trick with the subtype. So if we want distinct variables, we can do the same subtype trick again. Uh, no problem. Um, yeah, anything that is changing orders around is a bit hairy with the brown, in my experience. Um, another thing that is also not possible in, in nominal is if we want to have, for example, an n-ary application, not just binary application. It works exactly how you would expect. We say, okay, instead of just having a single expression, we extend it for a list of expression, and then say, okay, for all of these, we bind this in all of these. Well, this shouldn't be, oh, this isn't the wrong thing. It should be here. Disregard this. So assuming we have a lambda that has multiple bodies, this would be a lambda with multiple bodies. Otherwise, we put the list in the application case, of course. But yeah, this would still be a valid definition. It would just not be the definition that corresponds to this uh, thing up here. So um, the one thing that's very annoying about nominal two at the moment, um, one of the reasons I that prompted this development is that's really nominal cannot recurse through other data types, which means you need to unfold them all basically into a mutual recursion, defining a type that is isomorphic to list, but mutually recursive with this type. So that means also that you lose all the theorems that are already in a standard library about lists because it's not a list. It's just something isomorphic to one. Uh, with this, you can just directly express what you wanted to express in the beginning. Um, but even the binding structure. So, so far we have only simple binding structures where something is bound in some other part. Um, Ledrec is a bit more interesting because we bind recursively. All of them are bound in all of them here. And at the same time, in, in the right-hand side of this, this lead rack as well. So uh, this, we, we can still uh, um, select in, yeah, there's a lead rack. Uh, we can still select inside even other types to express this binding relation. Um, as far as I know, given these uh, annotations, we can pretty much express any arbitrary binding pattern that we would like to express. Uh, yeah. So the one big thing that we extend upon is that this is not limited to finite syntax. So everything we've seen before was just normal data types with finite syntax. We can go beyond that. And in this case, it's just as easy, for example, as to say, okay, we bind not a finite set of variables, but we just abound it, so bound it by some cardinal. We could, for example, bind um, countably many variables or uncountably many variables, as long as you have some cardinal that bounds the set. And the same here for this list of things we bind. We could use this L list type, which stands for lazy list, um, which we use a normal Isabel codata type for. So a code type is an infinite, well, in this case, a possibly infinite list. We could also use a stream, depending on our formalization, um, that is possibly infinite. And we can nest that and recurse through it just how we did with normal data types. So we can freely mix and match data types and code data types. Um, in fact, while uh, we are working on, a, well, as an example case study, working on a formalization of this paper, 
which defines uh, an infinite lambda calculus. Well, not an infinite lambda calculus, but a lambda calculus binds basically infinitely many variables with some <laughs> specifics. And there's this feature is necessary to be able to express this directly. Uh, because as we found out, there are some mistakes in this paper that are that comes from um, this 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 hairy distinction between what is infinite and what is not infinite, and where you need to be really careful about substitution, for example, that you do not uh, substitute too much or too little. Um, again, there's a little asterisk here, so it, there's nothing. We could still also define our whole type to be infinitely deep. So this type here is infinitely wide because the list can be has any enemies, but our depth of the syntax tree is still finite. Um, we can also have something that is infinitely deep. So basically a boom tree with bindings. Um, the asterisk is there that this is currently not, well, the type is implemented, but you cannot define any functions on it currently. So the co-recursor is not implemented yet. So you can define the type, but you cannot do anything including substitution. So it's kind of useless at the moment. So at the moment you can do this nesting or existing normal codata types uh, in, in your type and bind through and recurse through them. You cannot really do infinitely deep stuff that is to be done, but it's totally possible uh, with the framework. So part two of this, uh, so let's let just ask the questions now for this first part. Yes. Thanks. So you showed us a whole series of different binding styles yes. that you could capture, you know, a single variable, list of variables, and so on. I was a bit unclear as to whether the Isabel you were showing us, was this a series of different uses of one principle, or was it a series of separate cases that you've implemented in your framework to cover all these different styles? So, and and if, if it's the latter, are you sure you've got them all? No. So, uh... Internally, this is all the same thing. Uh, basically, this is the data types are similar to the normal Isabel data types are um, fixed points of functors, and the the binding part is a bit more structured to the functor. But all of these is basically just how we choose the functor, basically. But it's all the same thing in the end. All right. So relating to that, yeah, I'm wondering. Uh, well, what the scope of this is, how far it extends. There's, there was a paper at ESOP 2015 called a Theory of Name Resolution or something. It was the best paper at ESOP 2015. And they covered all kinds of weird and wonderful binding and, and scoping constructs. I wonder so I whether you could cover all of those. Or... I haven't read that paper, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, it I might be worth having a look. But um, and then specifically, I wonder if you can handle things like dynamic binding constructs here. Uh, in what sense, dynamic? Uh, well, like in Lisp, <laughs> common Lisp. It should work, in my opinion, uh, as long as you can express this as a. So, in general, the whole the, the whole point of this section was if you can express it as a type you can bind it and you can bind through it. So as long as you can express this in Isabel, you should be able to use it for binding. I'm not entirely sure about this being able to express it in Isabel part um, or how direct you can express it, but that would is definitely a very interesting thing to do. All right. So related to this, so now we have data types, but usually for proofs, we need more than just data types. Yeah, that's great. Um, we usually work on some inductively or possibly co-inductively defined predicates to work on those types, to give them meaning and semantics. So going back to the simply typed lambda calculus, um, usually, for example, we want to present some uh, this, this predicate or for um, typing. So when when is a term well typed? And you see here that in, in these predicates, naturally, of course, there will be binders popping up just given that we are using types that have binders. So if we look at this in a pen and paper proof, again, we see this line. We assume that the bound variables are different from whatever the author wanted them to be different from. But we are in a theorem prover. We need to prove that this is possible. So um, the second part of our work is basically identifying 
how and when we can improve the inductive predicate, uh, the, induc the induction theorem that naturally arises from these rules. How can we improve it to strengthen this? So we can define this predicate directly in Isabel without an issue. Um, but yeah, similar to, to before, we want to get this extra assumption. This X is definitely not in this lambda term or, whoops, that should have deleted the other one. But yeah, it basically should not be in, in this, uh, should not be in anything for this lambda. Um, and there's also previous work that tries to find basically general rules when it is possible to extend uh, the predicate. Um, because it's not always possible. That, that's one of the big problems with just assuming that it works is if you use a variable both free and bound at the same time in the same rule, you obviously cannot just assume that they will be distinct. But it might not be that obvious from the rule itself. So this paper by uh, Urban, Berghofer, and Norris um, tried to find a general rule when to uh, when it's possible to do that and how to do it. And the problem is they are looking at the specific syntactic format of these introduction rules. So basically looking at giving a specific syntactic criteria when these assumptions are valid or when it's possible to do so. <coughs> the problem with that is if, for example, uh, completely eliminates the ability to use higher order relators. So if you have a list of something, you want to use a list relator to relate over all elements of the list. And that immediately prevents that. So what we have been doing, of course, it doesn't go away. Well, wonderful. Um, we have been doing a, the, um, having just a simple um, semantic approach to this problem uh, based again on the fixed point that uh, is underneath this inductive predicate. Um, and we identified there's only two uh, um, properties that this um, fixed point or the operator of the fixed point needs to fulfill. One is equivariance. Yeah, this paper should have gone away now. Uh, equivariance basically just means you can move a renaming into the function. So if I have some bijection f that renames variables and I call f of g of x, it should be the same as g of f of x. That's equivariant. So if all the operations I use in my inductive predicate are equivariant, that's the first property. The second property is a bit more nebulous and it cannot be easily defined like this. It's we call refreshability. It You can basically say that if you have bound variables, you can rename them and not change the stuff you do not want to change. Or, well, and you change them, can change them everywhere you, where you need them to change. For example, uh, given here this, uh, this, this uh, rule again, if you want to change this variable here, of, we also need to, uh, or, or we need to make sure that we change this here and possibly in a context if we allow multiple variables in the same context um, and in, in the body. So this just, no, we don't want to change it in the context, but it shouldn't be there. But so this this rule, this refreshability basically makes sure that there is no clash between what we have in some extra part of the proof versus the thing we want to change the variables around so we can make sure that they are not clashing with everything I have. Um, for this part, this inductive predicate part, we have no automation yet. So the, currently this is more or less, we know how to do it, but we have not done it ever convenient to use um, compared to the data type, which is a very much automatic. So to wrap this all up, um, in Isabel with this framework, which is not completely done yet, uh, we can define data types of bindings and uh, that even model very complex binding relations. Um, and the big part is we can freely bind and recurse through other things that are not necessarily data types in the classical sense, but also things like quotients or subtypes, um, as long as they behave well in a certain sense. Um, and we get this very strong induction principle for free, and we get a lot of constants uh, and functions for free, like substitutions. Um, and we can improve these inductive predicates uh, that use these types. Uh, so we can also assume these same strong induction principles um, for these predicates, and when it is possible and sound to do so. Yeah, thank you.
Any questions? Oh, it crashed immediately. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Um, so normal two is obviously powered by normal sets, uh, but you're using a different formalism, but so, you get similar properties. So uh, what's the reason for moving from one to the other? It's it's more how you view the thing. So you can could state the whole the same talk in terms of nominal sets. And the thing is, it's inspired by nominal logic, but it's not directly an implementation of nominal logic. Um, it doesn't assume any atoms, or it doesn't assume a set of atoms or anything like that. And equivariance is only necessary for these inductive predicates. For the types itself, we do not need anything from the user as proofs. Um, but yeah, so for example, we are currently preparing a paper that to be submitted at Lix, and uh, there we are formulating, well, viewing it through the lens of nominal sets, basically. So uh, can, can I ask a clarifying thing? The, the, so is, is this a, a sort of foundation independent uh, in, in the sense of like uh, representation of the variable independent? Yeah, yeah, so what you saw in, in all the um, code is that we left the type of variables unspecified. So it was just a parameter to the type. Um, you can choose any type that is big enough. So if you have a finite syntax, you need some type that is countable. So for finite syntax, for example, natural numbers, you, you can use as variables or strings, both them are fine. But if you get into you know, stuff like code data types, we need to make sure that the, you have enough variables to substitute so you always have fresh variables. So if you have an infinite type, we could use up all natural numbers so we can't get fresh natural numbers to substitute in. Um, so that's why we then require the, this, this type to be bigger than countable. Um, but other than that, you're completely free in choosing uh, whatever you want to use, even something with more complex structure than just a name. Um, at the very beginning, you mentioned Haskell Core. Uh, so yes. I, I wondered, firstly, what, what is that exactly? And also, how much power do you need from your framework to be able to deal with that? So like Haskell what? Core is basically, so, so all of, Haskell is a very big language with a lot of features. But it comp it desugars down to a very simple imperative uh, functional language um, called core, and most of the optimizations are done on core, and then it just gets lowered down further to assembly. And uh, contrary to many compiler intermediate languages, this is a type language, so this is basically a system F with some extensions. So from the complexity of the binding. I only need the second slide of, of the examples, which was system F with variables in the types and variables on the, on the terms. Uh, but for the convenience part with all the stuff I get for free, this is still very nice. Um, the one problem, so I tried doing this with nominal already, the uh, formalizing system F. One of the problems was that I need to bind lists of things and, uh, and also recurse, like have lists of, of terms which is not directly possible. So I needed to, I was constantly re, um, converting between my mutual recursive list type and the Isabel list type back and forth for the three theorems, which was really annoying. And what Nominal really struggled with was um, binding multiple lists of multiple different variable kinds. So for example, for case expressions in system F, you first bind a list of, um, a, a, a type variables and a list of variable variables for the constructor cases. And nominal had problems because it basically had to mesh all of them together into one list and then you manually needed to put them, uh, like filter them out into two different lists again because in the nominal two um, implementation, there's only ever one binder that binds a list of things, which is very limiting. And this is not limited to this as all. So the structure is all in, in, in the in the type itself. Oh, so you, you've got the power already in the framework then? Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, the okay. framework is, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, and let's uh, thank Jan again. Thank you. Oh yeah, just one last, if you're interested. So um, the whole thing is basically a, a bunch of um, axiomatizations on top of axiomatizations. Um, and most of this is automated. But as you see here, as I mentioned earlier, the co-recursive is still the big thing that's missing. But yeah.